quick show of hands, how many APPs in the audience? Few, hold them up high. How many of you, keep your hands up if you perform cystoscopy yourself? Nobody, okay. How many practicing urologists in the audience? Raise your hand. Put your hand down if you're fellowship trained in urethral surgery. Of the ones holding up their hands, how many of you, I said put your hand down if you're fellowship trained in urethral surgery. How, of the ones still holding up your hands, how many of you do urethroplasty? So two people. All right, so I got an audience of two. All right. Now maybe I'll make some believers to the rest of you. So anyways, I've got 10 minutes, right, to talk to you about something that took me years to learn. Right? and years to home. So I'm going to try to talk about some key elements of what I feel are relevant to success if you're going to handle, you know, some kind of part-time plumbing in this uh, sphere. So we'll talk about preoptive planning. We'll talk about some technical considerations as well. So we mentioned about, we talked earlier about coaching, about mentorship. I mean, I'm not giving you knowledge that I generated de novo in this presentation. A lot of it's borrowed from other people. So I was trained by Santucci, Flynn, and Mori, who they themselves were trained by other respected figures in reconstructive urology, and I tried to pass it on to my fellows as well. Um, as with any type of surgery that we offer in urology, setting expectations is crucial, right? Under promise, over deliver. So, there is a value to urethroplasty over some of the conservative management with you know, endoscopic procedures, right? And there, but there's never a guarantee of success. So truth be told, I use some optolume, but one of the things, if you think about this randomized study, right, it was randomized to standard of care dilation. What did that consist of? We don't know, right, a hodgepodge. It wasn't like they got balloons without coating and balloons with coating. So it's not really apples to apples in that sense. And also, if you're having younger patients, right, and you're talking about, you know, barrier contraception for a while, you know, that, that's a conversation that they're not too keen on, okay? So there are going to be patients that are going to want something else, okay? The rates of success depend on the definition, our definition versus their definition. You showed a really nice picture of that uh, hypospadias patient that you wanted to fix. So I would have probably fixed that too. But if you look at the retrograde urethrogram and measure, I would guess that the diameter of the narrowed segment was more than four and a half millimeters. Well, that means it was probably 14 French or more, which would be considered success with endoscopic management, even with just minimal resistance to pass. Sometimes you want more than that. Sometimes a patient wants more than that. So, and I would encourage you to have a conversation with your patients about outcomes, rather than just saying, here, sign at the bottom of this consent, and it says on there, oh, we talked about ED, we talk about you know, recovery and so forth, okay? Think about what's the worst that could happen. I think this is true in any type of surgery we do, cancer surgery, stone surgery, or what have you. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best, certainly plan for the best. Um, but you wanna think, is the worst case scenario worth the risk? Okay, if you get in there, you might have an A and a B plan, but by the time you come out and reconstruct a purology, a lot of us know you might get down to a G plan, all right? And then going back to our G2211 conversation, a lot of these patients, we own them, right? We're gonna see them long-term. So I'm not gonna go through all these because of time constraints, right? When uh, I was approached to give this lecture, it was you know, to focus on just an anastomotic urethroplasty. And there's different ways to do that. There was a nice slide that talked about non-transecting, transecting, and so forth. But if we're gonna consider this, recognize that even though I'm not talking about substitution urethroplasty with an oral graft, if you're going to do anastomotic repairs, you have to be prepared for the situation that it's not possible, what are you gonna do now in the operating room, okay? So the proximal bulb has got a little bit more slack. Uh, you can treat longer strictures. Um, granted, I was on a paper I'm talking about the extended application, but I don't really feel that that's practical for most patients. I feel like if you're in the two to three centimeter range of the proximal bulb, you have to consider the anatomy, what they've had done before. Uh, it's less forgiving in the distal bulb. So most surgeons don't like surprises, usually. So try to know everything you can know about this patient, their medical history, surgical history, uh, their expectations. Draw a line in the sand uh, in advance and try not to compromise. So if you say, well, I want patients uh, blood thinning medications for this amount of time, and they show up and they forgot, or they didn't follow your instructions, what are you gonna do? You're gonna feel pressure to move forward because they took time off work, it's on your OR block schedule, you want good outcomes. So if you set some rules, stick to your rules. Same thing, if you feel they need a negative urine culture beforehand. 
Bring all pertinent parties to the table. It might involve their primary care doctor, their cardiologist, depending on their medical history, and explain to the patient from the time you roll into the operating room to the time they're catheter free, what that looks like while you have them in the clinic preoperatively. So in terms of assessment of strictures, we talk about retrograde urethrography. Depending on where you're working, the skill level of your you know, radi radiology team might be different, right? I see a lot of rugs where the patients aren't positioned properly. But if a rug is ever gonna estimate stricture length, it's typically going to underestimate it just based on the vectors. So you have to be prepared for that. Cystoscopy is certainly nice to identify the front end, but if you're not gonna disrupt it and push through it, you can identify on the external anatomy where it is, get an idea. Now, if they've got super pubic access and you can come from both ways, that's pretty nice. Um, can't always get a uh, wire across if it's obliterative though, right, and interoperatively. So I just I wanted to put this term urethral rest into the literature when I was a fellow because, you know, I was trained according to the mantra of you know you have to see it to treat it, and if you read some of the papers from George Webster back in the day, they talked about when failures occurred, where did they occur? They typically occurred at one end of the repair, so chances are you weren't extending your surgery well enough into healthy tissue. And if patients had had recent dilations, recent catheters taken out right before surgery, it can make it look better than it's going to look once that tissue calms down. So this image, which was included in the paper, this patient had a 16 French catheter in six weeks earlier. You see they obliterated. So if I had kept that catheter in to the time of surgery and thought, wow, this part's 16 French, it looks pretty good. I might have undertreated that because we don't like to add grafts to obliterative disease. I would encourage you when you operate to come up with a protocol and stick to it. We, at my institution, we call it the sweet technique, same way each and every time. Um, and then you wanna, if you do something regularly and you have a lot of turnover in your OR staff like we do, I see a lot of travelers still. I mean, I know we're starting to crack down on that, but I still have people who have never seen this case. And so, and if you're say, you ask for an instrument because you didn't look at your back table and somebody else set it up and it's not there, and now you're, you're wasting all this time, people in and out of the room. So I would encourage you to have video primers. You can put it on YouTube, you can put it in a shared folder for any new people to check everything before they come to your case. Now, if there's a possibility you do take a graph, you wanna have a pregame with anesthesia, where do you want your ET tube, what type of anesthesia, of course, um, if you're comfortable with them giving your patients and say it's at the end of the case. I mentioned the whole exposure is everything uh, concept before. Um, a lot of times you're gonna be working with an assistant, but depending on how you've positioned the patient, it can be tight in the perineum. So, you know, get some tips. Uh, Brian's a master of setting up an operative field before a case ever starts. Um, so it, it sounds like a simple thing, but just draping a patient, setting up the field is very important. You wanna free your hands, you never wanna struggle. So I've often said that my Lone Star Retractor is one of the best medical students I've ever had. And so uh, take full advantage. Some people, they start to lose steam assisting you in surgery and they're just you know, not cognitively in it anymore. And you'll see that yank hour tip just resting on something that because there's a small amount of blood and they wanna feel useful. But if you're sucking aggressively on mucosa, you plan to leave in the patient. It gets congested, it gets edematous, doesn't hold suture as well. So be mindful of that. If you're waiting for a suture to arrive, Hold pressure, don't just keep sucking incessantly. Illumination and magnification, we talk about this a lot in reconstruction, the pediatric guys do a good job of this. Robotics people have you know, some advantages on this as well. But if you're doing open surgery, you're wearing a headlight, you're wearing loops, just think about the ergonomics, the longevity of your career and be mindful. I, I bought a $9 uh, clavicle support from Don Joy. It just, uh, it's kind of foam and uh, it's got a Velcro strap. I just put this on. Uh, it preserves my posture. It's made a huge difference for me. You can find those online. Um, so have a plan going in, whether or not it's going to be a simple short stricture, put ends together, or if you're going to need substitution. We talked about scoping. If you can get a wire across, that's nice, um, but you can't always, okay? And you don't want to keep bumping into the stricture. Some people go to operate and they figure, well, I'm just going to put a fully catheter in, feel where it stops. That might not be accurate. You might be pushing in and disrupting or tearing the stricture. Same thing with bougie sounds, okay? So decide how you're going to expose the patient to have them positioned. It's obviously different for proximal strictures versus distal strictures, lithotomy versus supine. You can always tack the scrotum up if you want, or once you get in deep to let your hooks do the work on your self-retaining retractor. So I've already mentioned the first you want to handle the tissue delicately if you plan to leave it behind because tooth pickups, crushing edges of tissue that you're going to sew together, is not very good. 
So you want to mobilize the distal segment as needed and kind of see that bluish hue of the urethra coming through to know you've taken down the investing layers. And then you can always irrigate next to your catheter when you put it back together to make sure you've gotten it uh, together without leaks. I've already talked about the differences in the proximal bushes of the distal bulb as far as the length that you can get and the favorability. There is a dual, dorsal, uh, dual blood supply, but we still try to preserve bulbar arteries, arteries when we can. We can always. Sometimes it's tough uh, depending on your exposure, size of the patient, but blood flow is essential. So here's you know, a typical incision, the perineum, uh, exposure circumferentially, you can use a vessel loop. Uh, it's quite helpful. Some people use umbilical tape and other things uh, just to kind of give a little bit of stretch as you take it off the septum. Once you've removed the stricture, we still talk about spatulation, usually on opposite sides. The amount of evidence to support spatulation, I don't know that that's super strong, but you know, wider anastomosis logically makes good sense. And then we start putting it together. Now, if you're really proximal, typically we'll do full thickness on the dorsal half, and then you might be able to get a two-layer closure on the front, where you bring mucosa to mucosa, and because the sponge is more eccentric in the front, you close that overwards, uh, over the top, excuse me. So just wanted another plug for Paul Maroney. He told me one time that if he's ever in a case and it's just not going the way it should and he's getting frustrated, he stops, and he asks his team, if this was going perfectly, what would it look like? And that really is helpful to get back on track. So always feel your way with midline identification. Urethra lives between the, uh, the rami. Uh, blunt dissection is fine for virgin cases, but in reoperative cases, not a good idea. You want to rely more heavily on sharp dissection. Go from known to unknown. It's really easy to find the urethra distally before you get into a hole proximally. And uh, if you haven't done this type of work, ask for help the first few times that you're doing it. So a lot of what we do, the success is defined before we ever get to the operating room, stick to your plan, and you know, like my Colombian friends will say, coge la suave, which means take it smooth, keep yourself calm in surgery. Thank you.